So, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, please allow me to introduce myself uh, to all members and all the guests. But uh, first, I want to thank uh, Yuri, John, Captain Philip, and all of you for the invitation and for this opportunity to present myself, my organization, my country, and my history. I would have liked to be with you in this special event that we have that we for a while. Uh, but uh, voila. So I am uh, uh, president and founder uh, since 2014 of a non profit organization called Association Didon of Carthage. Our main objective is to promote our uh, and uh, highlight our. Uh, the history of our country, Tunisia, and especially the history of Carthage. We organize conferences, presentations, and visits to archaeological sites with national renowned historian. We were uh, happy to have uh, prepared uh, the reception of uh, Phoenicia ship expedition in 2019 at Carthage in Tunisia and then at Sawira and Morocco. And uh, in both events, ministers, ambassadors, advisor of the King of Morocco, and several personality were present. This event is important for uh, our generation and also for uh, the future uh, generation to say uh, how North African and American are related since about 3,000 years or maybe more. As a Tunisian and Carthaginian, we were very proud of being part of the Phoenician ship expedition. And uh, now, personally, I'm even prouder to participate to this uh, outstanding project of Phoenician ship museum to make it real, where finally Phoenician ship will get a home after years of hard work. The idea is not a simple museum, it's a very important project which will highlight the important three millennium relationship between the Venetians, Carthaginians, and Americans. Uh, please allow me to give a little insight into this historical relationship. According to the book of the Chronicle of the Kings in the Bible, King Solomon and the Iran, King Tyre, uh, was uh, Tyre's king, was intermarried, and uh, together they built uh, the Temple of uh, Jerusalem. Uh, both they sent their ships to the Western Mediterranean to open new counters. Commercially, they were too powerful. That's why the Greeks nicknamed them the business Phoenicians or Phoenicians. So in uh, this Western Mediterranean, the Phoenicians settled in the including area of uh, the North Africa and uh, the north shore of the Mediterranean. When they settled in Tunisia, Phoenicians will mix with the population of that time, including Numidians, uh, Getules, and Libic. And then they will form the Punic people. It's always the Greek who will give this uh, name because the Punica is from a pomegranate, and when the walls of the fruit are, are open, it sends uh, its grain everywhere from where the Carthaginian uh, counters. These uh, Carthaginian counters will make Carthage the fire of the sea. The Carthaginian ships will go with uh, two admirals. Admiral Anna uh, to Cameroon, and with Admiral uh, in midpoint, they will cross Sicily. They follow uh, the northern coast of the Mediterranean, high pass Spain, go up towards Aquitaine, towards Brittany to look for tin. Brit, uh, they call it the place where they found metal tin, Brit tin, the country of islands between tin. As you know, uh, as you know, tin makes the islands between all metals. Then the Carthaginians up um, along the English Channel across it, settled in Cornwall. So in 2019, Philip, Captain Philip Beale had the genius idea of returning from Cornwall to Carthage, and uh, the Phoenician ship sailed in the Mediterranean to reach Carthage from to reach Carthage, and from Carthage to Mogador, uh, crossing the Atlantic, the Venetia ship arrives finally, as we know, in 2020 to Florida. So, uh, looking for metals, metals, Phoenician and Punics arrived in America long before Christopher Columbus in search 
of uh, copper ore because tin and copper form a bronze and the uh, Carthaginian could make uh, from this strong alliance of the two metals all kinds of statues and objects. As a uh, Tunisian, we are very, very proud that Carthage was the first to have a good constitution. Carthage is very proud to have developed agriculture with migrants' boots. Uh, Carthage was very proud to have invented the uh, nautical industry and at the Punic port, both were manufactured in kit form. And, uh, and Carthage could quickly line up 220 ships. So Carthage was leader also uh, of purple and uh, it was known for its wheat production. Carthage was the granary of Rome and it has still, uh, it has and still has an important production of olive oil. Carthage had a lot of vineyards. And after uh, 2,000 years, we found um, in the Mediterranean uh, crooked uh, amphor still containing wine. So Carthage was a great power based on uh, trade and uh, peace. Highlighting the richness of the history of Carthage is our main object of this organization. And now I am honored to cooperate with you to highlight this historical relationship by promoting and sponsoring the project of the Tunisia Ship Museum. Thank you. So I let uh, uh, I give the word to Hassan. Yes. Hi again, everyone. Um, I'm here from my purple dye uh, workshop in Carthage, and I'm very pleased to be uh, among you today. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank all those who made this lovely online encounter a possible. For instance, Mr. John Dalkri. Uh, I'm sorry if I didn't uh, pronounce your name properly. Uh, also, all your hosts and all the organizers of this conference. Uh, I'm also very happy to see again uh, some of the Phoenicia crew members uh, almost three years after the long-awaited arrival, uh, their long-awaited arrival to Carthage. My name is Mohamed Hassan Duira, and I'm currently an operations manager um, in a market research company, and also a member of Club de Carthage, in charge of communication, and a founder of Argaman, the first company entirely dedicated to the revival of the fabled Phoenician royal purple dye in over 500 years. Now, what time is it? For those of you all, especially when I speak about the history of Carthage, and I think that some of you guys here, like Yuri and Boyd, have experienced firsthand this daily torture when they had listened to me talking for hours about Carthage and Phoenicians and how, how what they represented for us. So honestly, I I wanted to this speech to be spontaneous uh, initially, but I knew that I would end up talking for three hours. And certainly, you have a lot better to do uh, this afternoon. So I I just I have written a a, a short lecture and uh, I I set my stopwatch also so that I can keep track of time. So no worry, guys. Okay, so before sharing with you the wonderful memories we had with the Phoenicia crew, uh, let me just give you an overview of the historical background that made this expedition so dear to our hearts. As many of you already know, Carthage, which was the capital of the Carthaginian Empire, and which is now an affluent suburb of Tunis, was closely related to the Phoenician world. Indeed, legend has it that the Tinderian princess, Melissar, also known as Dido, and her wealthy companions founded the city of Carthage around 840 BC, and the Tunisian coast were, by that time, already adopted with bustling commercial outposts, founded by the same mysterious people of the sea, known as the Canaanites, later called Phoenicians by the Greeks, and these same people who were the inventors of the alphabet and the instigators of international trade. The Phoenicians found in Tunisia the perfect place to, to reinforce and extend their sprawling commercial network, and above all, control the western trade routes leading to the Pillars of Hercules, today known as the Straits of Gibraltar, which were also the ancient gateway to the Atlantic. Carthage quickly grew to become a magnificent metropolis of over half a million people, even though the city maintained very close relations 
with Phoenicia in general and her mother's city of Tyre in particular, the city became by the 6th century BC the capital of the Arab Carthaginian Empire, especially after the sack of Tyre by the Babylonians at 573 BC. And as Tyre's flame burned out, Carthage would soon grow to become an outrageously wealthy superpower to be reckoned with, brimming with palaces, libraries, high-rise buildings of up to six stories high, all surrounded by massive walls nearly 40 miles in length. The city was also home to a state-of-the-art dual harbor, the like of which the world had never seen. It was from there that Carthage controlled over 300 colonies on both sides of the Mediterranean, thanks to its mighty commercial and military fleets that gave her absolute control on the Western Mediterranean trade routes. The ambitious Punic capital is also considered to be the first republic in known history, having developed one of the oldest and most sophisticated constitutions on, of all time. A constitution lengthily praised by the, his, the Greek historian Aristotle himself in his book Politica. Politica. Carthage also offered the world the first known encyclopedia of agronomy, including a staggering 28 volume written by the Carthaginian engineer Mago in the 5th century BC. Uh, but the success of Carthage, also the original name of Carthage, which literally means new city in Phoenician, also led to her demise in a way, as the city's overwhelming presence in Sicily and Sardinia halted the Romans' expansion plans, and by the 3rd century BC, Carthage became a sphere pointed to the very front of the front. And after three bloody wars, known as the Punic Wars, the once magnificent Punic metropolis, which was great, Tales of fame and beauty reached the far ends of the known world, became the theater of the first documented Holocaust in known history. In April of 146 BC, when the Roman legions finally managed to make a breach of the city walls after a long three years each and engaged in an orgy of mass killings that resulted in the slaughter of 400,000 civilians, while 50,000 more were enslaved in just six days. The city then systematically was looted, sacked, and burned to the ground, and the fire lasted for 17 days. And so ashamed were the Romans by the horrific tales of the slaughter that started to reach the neighboring cities, like the pungent stench of death that spread like a contagious disease by the Mediterranean breeze. They engaged in a heinous propaganda against the Carthaginians in particular and their Phoenician ancestors in general, to portray them as savage and barbaric aliens who didn't deserve to live, believing that demonizing the victim would certainly ease the shame of their barbaric crime. I must admit that the Romans have did in, in, indeed do a such great such a great job in raising the trying to raise the uh, the memory of the Carthaginians and the Phoenicians off the face of the earth. Such a great job that most Phoenicians today, unfortunately, hardly know anything about Punic Carthage or the Phoenicians who founded the city in the first place, and instead believe that it was Rome who founded Carthago and not Tyre. For the view of us who are still determined to denounce the historical injustice of which the Phoenicians and Carthaginians were victims, and for those of us who have worked very hard to unravel the hidden truth about these remarkable civilizations, the news of the Phoenicia coming to Carthage was like a dream for us, a dream from which none of us wanted to wake, because it woke up in our hearts a rush of conflicting, of conflicting emotions that lie dormant in our hearts and souls for years, and that the common of the Venetia ship rustled from their deep slumber. We considered the crew like the heroes who will finally help unravel the truth about the betray or betrayed ancestors and wipe away the malicious lies that have been told about them for centuries. For us, the Phoenicia project was the perfect opportunity to show the world how their, these long-lost civilizations, what these civilizations were capable of, including the crossing of the Atlantic 1,500 years before Columbus and above all, to spread their universal values, which were based on tolerance, resistance, and freedom. Even though we had very little time to prepare for the first coming, everyone was so excited and so motivated, and we quickly mobilized all our network of friends and 
and, and contacts nationwide to help make this adventure a stunning success yes. and to make sure the cruise stay in Tunisia was yeah. as worry-free and as productive as possible. Indeed, in addition to the accommodations arrangements, which included gathering all the necessary supplies for the Atlantic crossing, we arranged the mooring of the ship in one of the country's fanciest and most secured harbors, which is the Marina of the Mar. Club Didon also organized a big ceremony where ministers and highly ranked government officials were present to honor the Phoenicia crew members who sailed the rough seas and went through so much trouble to make sure the expedition started to finish. We also made sure to take the team on a tour to visit some of Carthage's most famous historical and cultural landmarks and monuments. We went as far as, visit, as visiting Kirpwan, which is the only Punic city in the whole Mediterranean that preserved perfectly its Carthaginian style, complete with Punic mosaics known as Pugmenta Panica, Punica, sorry, uh, ancient purple dye and lime factories and individual bathtubs in Africa. We also went to Pisdras, known as Gem, which was also initially founded by the Phoenicians, then swayed under the control of Rome, and the city lies in the crossroad of the trade, trade route uh, of central Tunisia, and was the home, home of the second largest uh, Cullus Colosseum in the, in the Roman Empire. Then going back to Carpet, a cocktail at the city hall and a subsequent dinner hosted by the mayor of Carthage herself were also organized to honor the crew and make their achievements, as well as the cultural and historical goals of the expedition in the long and midterms known to the general public. The coming of the Phoenicia was also highly mediatized and drew the attention of several local, private, and public organizations schools, universities, and lots and lots of curious families who were so delighted to witness firsthand, even for a few days, the glory of Carthage rise from its ashes again. We keep nothing but wonderful memories from this incredibly rich human adventure, and we believe that the presence of the crew in the heart of Carthage and their availability and patience to show people around and to talk about the project really help raise the awareness about the unparalleled achievements of our Phoenician and Carthaginian ancestors. Something that is hardly taught, unfortunately, in our schools, and for this and this we will forever be grateful to the whole crew who will always occupy a very special place in our heart and who will forever be welcome to their second homeland to need. Our memories of the week we spent together in Carthage are still as fresh as if the Phoenicians came yesterday. You left such a great impression in the hearts of all the Tunisians who visited the ship, and even or even those who heard of, who just heard about this unique and daring adventure. And you can always rely on our un unconditional support to keep promoting this historical project because we are deeply convinced that it can change the course of history and make this world a better place by bringing people from different parts of the world and different backgrounds together regardless of their differences just like the Phoenicians did for thousands of years. Now I will transition with my personal story with the history of Carthage. As a matter of fact, I don't have any historical academic background. I didn't study history. And I, as a matter of fact, I hated history when I was young, to be honest with you. Uh, I've always thought that history was just a purposeless and boring course, a fantasy world that had no ties with reality. Until that fateful day of 1994 that changed my perception of history forever. And the cause of this drastic change was highly unexpected. It was a color or a dye that originated from the sea and ended up obsessing even the most ruthless and powerful of the emperors of antiquity with royal purple that lied in the core of the economy of the Phoenicians and Carthaginians and fascinated for thousands of years millions of people around the world, across the ancient world. A, a dye with extraordinary characteristics that was discovered and promoted by the Phoenicians for over 2,000 to 700 years and made the Carthaginian and Phoenician cities extremely wealthy. Uh, many of you may, may 
wonder how this adventure really started. Uh, it started when I was 14 years old in history class. We, we were, the teacher was talking about the uh, achievements of the Phoenicians and the Carthaginians and their economy and the products they, were, they, they used to, to trade in. And she said that the core of their economy was the industry of purple dye that they produced from murex snails and that were, and the dye was actually more than 25 worth its weight in gold. So in, in my mind, in my 14 years old clueless mind, I couldn't pr process that information. I couldn't believe that something this precious could come from these snails. And it took me 12 years in 2007 August 2007, to be precise, that the adventure, this childhood dream really materialized. When I came across a dead murex snail on the, sea, on, the court, on the shore of Carthage, the, the snail had a hole on its shell, and there was this mesmerizing red-purple color oozing from its opercula. This day marked the beginning of my adventure with purple dye, and I spent the next two weeks working in my apartment, uh, crushing shells, trying to figure out where the dye would come, would come, and uh, I faced nothing but criticism during those, those two weeks. Actually, it was just one week after my honeymoon, and uh, my, my my wife my wife almost almost kicked me out of the house, and my outraged neighbors almost called the police uh, at two occasions. So, so yeah, I was just. I could just kept crushing these shells until midnight, and I felt deep inside my heart that something was set was set in motion, and that nothing or no one would stop it. So, in this desperate attempt to save my marriage and, uh, or worse, to save his son from going to jail, my parent, my father, offered me a shed in his backyard and just told me, okay, knock yourself okay, off, knock yourself just do whatever you want, whatever you want. Whatever you want. Whatever you want. Uh, and this really marked my adventure with purple dye. It took me two years to produce my first uh, pigment, which was quite a bit dusty and obscure, but it was like a personal pride for me. Uh, and then I kept on improving the techniques of, uh, of dyeing and kept trying several blends uh, using different different species of murex and mixing the juices together and uh, coming up with different formulas for, for, for different colors. And uh, it took me like 14 years of research and, and hard work to reach this level. Now I have a the world's largest collection of pure murex extracts, which consists of 35 uh, different colors, of pure humorex extracts, and over 80 different colors on different fabrics, including silk, wool, linen, and cotton. In addition to being a pleasure to the eye, these dyes really changed my life forever, as they made me learn more about my history, my cultural heritage, my roots, my identity. And the minute I realized the tremendous potential, historical and cultural potential of, the, of this legendary color, I vowed to, re to revive it and share its magic with the whole world for as long as I would walk the earth. And I will be very happy to contribute in your project in any way we can, Club du Don of Carthage and myself, uh, through my company, Argamon. And I'm very happy to provide you with purple dye samples, which I'm sure will be. Uh, a very good addition to your, to your beautiful collection of artifacts, and uh, I'm sure that it will drive many, many visitors to your museums. As a matter of fact, more than 85% of my clientele comes from the U.S., so I know firsthand how Americans are interested in this legendary color and how how they really uh, love the history behind this, this color that really revolutionized the ancient world in so many ways. Thank you again for the invitation. Thank you for everything you've done so far. It's an important part of our history. And again, you can rely on our full cooperation to help you in this daring and amazing and historical project. Uh, okay, I think the stopwatch tells me to stop rolling my hand. So, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, if you have any questions or comments, Arish and myself will be happy to answer. Somebody offer a question. First of all, I just want to say hello, Eriz. Hello, Gassan. Nice to see you. Hey, boys. 
<laughs> I was holy. I was a family. How are you? Everybody's well. So good to see you. Thank you so, so much. So good to see you too. We, we missed you so much. <laughs> Next time, we want you all in Carthage. Yeah. I see Philip. Next time, Mississippi, Iowa. Yeah. Great. Hello, yeah, Philip. Sure. Yeah. It will be an honor. I have a question on the shells. Do they grow in salt water or do they grow in, in fresh water or combination? Okay, no, they, okay. they actually die in fresh water. If you put them in fresh water, they would die in like uh, 20 minutes. They they only live in seawater. And actually, the Durax uh, snails that are used to produce the dye are a part of a big family of culture today that includes over 2,200 different varieties, out of which only 12 species produce turtle dye. And they are scattered around the world from Australia to Japan to Mexico to the United States. You have also a, a snail that, that's called the uh, oyster dr driller, and that also produces Syrian purple. Uh, so in the Mediterranean, historically speaking, we have three different species that were historically used by the Romans, Byzantines, Carthaginians, and the Phoenicians to produce royal purple. Are except like Trunculus that produces indigo and violet, and Polinus brandaris that produces red purple, and famous uh, Amasoma or the blood mouth that produces a very deep red purple color. And the Tyrians had this a genius idea of melt of. Uh, blending different uh, secretions of different species together in a sequential way that will allow them to, to obtain the most beautiful and the most durable and the most vibrant red purple colors. That, you know, and that you know, one of the reasons why Tyre was outrageously wealthy because it literally controlled the industry, the very lucrative industry of royal purple for for centuries. And as a matter of fact, I don't know. I'm not sure if you know this information. Uh, by the third century AD, the emperor, the Roman emperor, De Clotian, uh, decided to set a, uh, a, a the 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 edit of the maximum, which consists of a the maximum prices uh, or, or rate card that uh, that that includes the maximum prices of a staggering twelve hundred products sold all across the Roman Empire, and the the cheapest product was a pound a, of green water, which uh, uh, the price of which was one denarii, and the top of the list, like the, the the most expensive thing you can ever imagine in the Roman Empire, was a pound of silk dyed in Tyrian purple. And the pound, and the Roman pound, is three hundred forty nine grams, approximately. Uh, and that this pound of silk dyed in royal purple uh, would cost over one hundred and fifty thousand denarii which was by far the most expensive thing they can buy in the Roman Empire uh, that would only equal the price of an adult male lion. So you can just imagine how 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 precious and how rare and how difficult the process of producing this, these guys uh, was. And at some point, the Romans uh, issued, like the Emperor Nero, issued decrees and laws preventing anyone from wearing purple or trading in purple without their permission, and anyone who would who would not comply would 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 be just hacked to death. So that was very serious stuff. Like the Romans really institutionalized the the industry of royal purple, and the this industry became under the direct control of the emperor. Because after three thousand two thousand five hundred years of over exploitation, over harvesting of murex, royal purple became very rare. So the emperors wanted every drop of purple for themselves, and they were really ready to kill for that. Question. Um, does the color purple have a spiritual symbol or meaning to the people? Yes. 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 Yes, and that's one of one, one of the reasons why this color had a a different status from you know compared to any other uh, natural color you can you can think of. There are other many other colors that were precious in ancient times, like Hermes, like indigo. Uh, like uh, like matter, but nothing really matched uh, royal purple. Royal purple or murex dyes in general are uh, both sacred for the Jews and the Christians. Uh, the Jews, for example, uh, the most valued and the most sacred color for the Jews is murex blue, which is the blue dye 
that, that is extracted from Rex snails. They call it the chalet, or sky blue in Hebrew. And according to many of my Jewish customers who told me the story, they believe that in Jewish tradition, they believe that God commanded Moses to ask his people to request from his people to dye strings of wool with murex blue and uh, attach them to their prayer shawls so that whenever they would look at these bright, these red, uh, bright, bright blue threads, they would, they would remember the commandments of God. So that was literally the most precious color for the Jews. We talked about the blue from Murat. While purple is has a lot has, has um, a tremendous value for the Christians. And as you know, uh, maybe Boyd can can tell you more about this this, this detail uh, because, as far as I know, in the Christian tradition, when the Christ was driven was was taken to the cross, and he he always told that he was the king of the people of Israel, and but at that time, the color of, the color of, of, uh, of royalty was purple. So in, a, in, a, in an attempt to mock him, they threw a purple toga on his back, so just to mock him. So for Christians, uh, this color became also the symbol of grief and sacrifice and became very, very important spiritually speaking. So yes, this color has a huge commercial value, a huge uh, historical and cultural and and um, and uh, and spiritual value. And this small creature doesn't only produce royal purple. You can also eat this, the, the the meat, which is very healthy and very delicious. It tastes halfway between crab and squid. It's out of this world. And the, the shell of the murex are very very. Uh, rich in calcium so you can just uh, 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 recycle them into a very high quality line that the ancients used to use for construction work to make stucco for the walls. Uh, they would also use the intestines or the unedible parts of the murex and macerate it in salt for several months to produce what they what, what, what they called the garum or the uh, uh, the, 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 the Carthaginian or the Phoenician fish sauce that was one of the most expensive condiments in the ancient world. And believe it or not, even the opercula of the murex, you know, this little nail-like uh, uh, part that uh, shuts the opercula of the, of the murex for protection, even that, they would take it and they would, uh, uh, they would boil it in brine or in vinegar for several hours until it's completely purified from all of its impurities, and then they would just uh, dry it and, and grind it to a, um, uh, into a thin powder, and they would uh, uh, mix it with the ingredients of incense, and that would work as, a, as an extraordinary incense fixative that would uh, enhance or uh, increase the, the, the fragrance of incense, but also make it uh, last much, much longer. So this, this small creature was really a, a blessing for the Phoenicians and the Carthaginians. It provided them with tons of food, for the uh, purple dye industry workers. It provided them with a lot of construction material. It provided them with fish sauce. It provided them with something with, with an incense fixative that they can use in their temples and in, in their religious uh, ceremonies. And of course, it produced these staggeringly expensive purple dye that they, 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 they spread all over the world and even brought to the, to the Irish coasts. Imagine something that would cost 20 to 30 times its weight in gold. So that was really, really, really one of the one of the uh, main sources of wealth for the Phoenicians and the Carthaginians for many, many, many centuries. So we have this artifact in America called the Phoenicia ship. Yeah. Time, we want you to. Can you visit. can you can you can you repeat, please? Uh, I think we couldn't hear the last word. We want you to come to America, receive that, <laughs> and we will, we will receive you, and we will show you your ship here. We will yeah. come to Carthage. We will make that a would, big. That would that would really be an honor for us to come to America and uh, and and be part of your project. And of course, you are all more than welcome to Carthage. Want to bring the Phoenicians to America. Yeah, yeah, that would be an honor for us. Thank you very much. And you are all very much welcome in Carthage. And uh, Kassan and Arish, um, can I thank you uh, on behalf of everybody here? You are two of the most wonderful people. Um, 
what you've done to support us, to support the Phoenician ship uh, has been incredible. And uh, we're so delighted to continue to work with you. Um, you are absolutely wonderful people. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philip. It was an honor and a duty. Thank you. Get a whole display. Okay, we're going to go see the mayor. Now we ask. Best of luck. Say a good prayer. Yeah, we sure will. No, no, don't worry about that. And we want to see you in Carthage, all of you, next year, hopefully. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you, Philip Boyd. Bye bye, Yuri. Bye. Thank you. That was great. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.